Hi everybody, I'm so glad to be here. Uh, my name is Elena Harkness. I remember like the single digit Chai Hack Night, so I'm really excited to be here in the like, what, 382? What was it, 382? Yeah. That's amazing. I just feel like I want to give a giant round of applause to this community for like, yeah, this is so fantastic. Great. So I am here with my team from Current. Uh, we'll talk about what Current is and what it does a little bit later, but we're here to talk about H2 Now Chicago, which is the first real-time water quality monitoring project in the US to measure microbial pollutants, which just rolls off the tongue. So I know you're all excited to learn a lot more. Okay, so how many of you have done some kind of recreational activity in the Chicago River, show of hands? Anything, walked alongside it, tried to swim in it, kayaked, okay, many people. Great, so you recognize the phenomenon of waking up on a beautiful Saturday. Um, it may have rained a lot the week before, maybe it didn't, you're not really sure, but how many of you think that on any given day, the Chicago River is probably a good place to do recreational activity? Any given day, like average day? Okay, ooh, not many, okay. So the Chicago River has a perception problem, okay. Um, so, your statistics and data people, it's Saturday, it looks nice outside, but you're not really sure if it's a great day to be in the river or not. Well, right now, or then, but really kind of like right now, the, the state of water quality testing is such that on that Saturday, if you wanted to figure out how good the quality of the Chicago River is, you can go out to the river, you can take a sample, you can send that sample to a lab, and in three to seven days, they will tell you if today was a good day to kayak. Except now it's not Saturday, and it's not pretty outside, and the weather in Chicago is notoriously changeable. Um, so this is not a really great way of keeping tabs on the fluctuating quality of our beloved Chicago River. So from then to H2 now, see what we did there. Um, H2 now is our goal of making the quality of the Chicago River monitored in real time. This QR code, if you take a picture of it, will take you straight to the H2 Now Chicago website, uh, which we're building out constantly and which has a lot of really interesting facts about the Chicago River, about our urban waterways here in Chicago, which we are blessed with many of, and about the technical features of this project itself. So the goals of H2 Now Chicago, I've said this and I'll keep saying it, real-time information about the microbial quality of the Chicago River. And importantly, we want to communicate that data to the public because actually the real quality of the Chicago River on any given day is actually pretty good. And we've found it's actually better than what a lot of people might think that it is. It's also fluctuating all the time for a lot of different reasons. And people mostly don't have a sense of that and how it works and what are the factors that might influence the quality of the Chicago River. So public education about both the current status and how to make better decisions about how to use it is a really important goal of the project. Okay, so why are we here doing this work? It sounds exciting, you're very excited about it, we are too, but who are we? So Current is a, itself it's a startup. We're about three years old and we are Chicago's water innovation hub. So what that means is we try to bring, we're a convener, like Shy Hack Night, we try to bring people across disciplines and sectors who care about water together to talk about how to do two things. One, build great companies and great technology to solve water problems here in Chicago. That's really exciting. We think Chicago is a great place to build a tech, a water tech business, um, whether that's software to help utilities figure out how to manage their operations better, or a chemical that helps tr with treatment, or something that decreases energy use. There's a million ways to make change in water, and we want those companies to be built right here in Chicago and to grow here. The second thing is that we want to bring technology from anywhere in the world that it exists, the best technology, to Chicago to solve our many water problems. So everyone has seen water in the headlines um, recently. It's washing up onto our bike paths. It is coming into our houses. Um, it's leaking into basements. Um, there are many ways that water has adverse impacts on our lives, but we also rely on it and frankly we take it for granted. So it's a really important drinking water source for us. Um, it's critical to the health of ecosystems that this Midwestern region is known for and they're singular in the world. Um, and we want to protect it. So we want to make sure that wherever this tech exists, we know it's a global marketplace for great ideas and great tech, we want that to come to Chicago. So those are the two things that Current exists to do. Um, and these are the kinds of organizations that we try to collaborate with and bring together. It's research partners, um, industry, innovators, investors, and utilities, many of which are represented here today. 
Okay, so part of what we try to do is tell the story about Chicago's water assets. I'm gonna spin through this really quickly, but a lot of people don't know that we have some of the biggest uh, water utilities in the world, both Jardine, right off of Navy Pier, which is our water intake, um, our drinking water facility is one of the largest in the world, and Stickney down here um, is the world's largest wastewater treatment plant of its kind. So one of our pitches to innovators is you can come here and if we can figure out a smart pilot with our utilities, you can really demonstrate that technology at scale. So that's really kind of exciting. Um, you all know that we sit on a lake and probably know we sit on a really important uh, river shed, a river system that connects us right down to the Gulf of Mexico. So Chicago, you know, while we're in the middle of the country, we're really connected in different ways to oceans, to the Gulf, and to both fresh and saltwater ecosystems that are really important. So we think that story uh, is an important building block, but so are the economic assets that make Chicago great, our research institutions, the talent pool that exists in this room, uh, financing and capital distribution channels for all of this technology, and global relationships with other kinds of um, companies and universities all over the world. We can talk about some of those, but we think we're a pretty great place to build water tech. I'm gonna skip some of these because I wanna spend time on our, um, you can see some of the companies that are here in Chicago. Um, we're gonna be telling this story uh, in a lot more detail on our World Water Day event coming up on March 19th. So if you're interested in the economic development side of this and why we care so much about making Chicago a great place to build, and grow tech companies, mark your calendars for March 19th, because that's gonna be the focus of our World Water Day event. Okay, more of our, okay, so phase one of H2 Now Chicago. So H2 Now is a great pilot for us because it demonstrates a lot of things that we want to do really well. Number one, it took a problem that the region cared about, which is monitoring real-time water quality, um, and it brokered the right partnerships to bring that to get, to bring together a solution. So, some of you, how many people are familiar with Chicago's Great Rivers plan? Show of hands. Okay, so we need to really get the word out about Great Rivers. Cool, so Great Rivers Chicago is a plan that's been around for about three years, I think, three? Four or five at this point. Four or five, okay. Okay, so it was a partnership with the Metropolitan Planning Council, the Chicago Community Trust, and an array of other partners and river stakeholders that care about the quality of life in the Chicago River. So. Um, again, it's a variable place. A lot of it has been used for heavy industry. There's a lot of rehabilitation that's been going on and lots still to do. But one of the goals, this was a plan that defined goals for 2020 and 2030. And one of the 2020 goals was getting real-time water quality information. So Current, being an organization that links up innovators and researchers and big industry partners and civic leaders, said, this sounds like a job for us. We'll take on the real-time water quality monitoring. We'll figure out how to make that happen. Um, we're also excited because this helps us achieve a goal that is important to Chicago and important to the U.S., reaching a global goal, or actually several global goals. So these are from the Sustainable Development Goals framework that the United Nations has out, and these point to goals that by 2030, we want you know, the whole world to have, everyone have access to clean water and sanitation, uh, life below water has to do with the health of aquatic communities. You've all heard about the Asian carp and the zebra mussels. Um, we care a lot about those aquatic ecosystems. And then also sustainable cities and communities. So first and foremost, I think we all are really interested in figuring out how to make this river a good asset for all the residents of Chicago. So it cuts right through north to south. The river's one of our great unifiers in a city that sometimes can feel divided by a lot of other factors, by you know, race, by socioeconomic status, and the river cuts through all of it. And we wanna see the riverfront revitalized and really an important step in that is having real-time quality about the river and so we see how it's doing over time. All right, so I'm gonna turn it over. Um, Svetlana, do you wanna talk through the tech partnerships? This is important because it shows how Current has been bundling uh, international and global tech partners to put this project together. We're pretty excited about it and we looked all over and you were part of the process of making that happen. So I'm gonna turn it over to our technical director to talk through the tech setup. Thank you, Lena. <clears throat> so we went through a process of looking for technologies that can tell us what is the microbial level in real time. And if you know something about, uh, as Elena was saying in the beginning, it takes at least a day for typical lab tests to tell you how many microbes there using traditional method. Um, so we scoped a universe of technologies from different countries, different states, um, had interviews, and there are quite a few actually technologies are being developed for that. It's a hot topic 
in, in the industry. And I should have said, can I pause for a second? I should have said by microbial com content, we're talking about monitoring fecal coliform. Yeah. Yeah, fecal coliform is one of them, but there are two yeah. other main ones that yeah. people look at when they look at the quality, microbial quality of mm -hmm. water. Uh, so we ended up on two technologies, one in the corner, uh, the, on the top there, it's called Proteus. Uh, so that has three sensors, uh, temperature, uh, turbidity, and TLF, it's an optical sensor that measures amino, uh, amino acids in the water. So all these three measurements uh, combi are combined together to give us some estimate of what the microbial levels are. Uh, and the other technology we're using is right in the middle on the bottom row, uh, Tecta PDS. So they also have a novel method, which is faster than the lab. Not, not real time, but we're using it as a reference. Uh, all other partners that you see here, they help us with actual delivery of this data in real time. So getting uh, the data up in the network, uh, putting it on the platform, visualizing it, analyzing it, uh, things that you guys know better than us. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Can I, okay, everyone, yeah. thing. I'll also just give you all a little context on what are fecal coliforms, as I realize you're all probably not biologists or scientists. Um, they are indicator organisms. Uh, they derive from warm-blooded animals, humans, dogs, rats. As long as it's got warm blood, it can generate a fecal coliform. And when they end up in the waterway, uh, their varying levels uh, can indicate the um, uh, presence of other potentially harmful uh, contaminants. So uh, by understanding what the levels are at any given time, you can get a pretty strong sense of what else might be in the waterway and then communicate that to say, hey, eh, maybe hang off there or it should be fairly okay to interact with that water. Yeah, good, that's great. I'm glad you said that. And I know there's an early, um, an early, I think, Datamate or Shy Hack Night project that, that asked, um, is there sewage in the river? I, I don't remember if that's like, I'm quite getting the name right. Yeah. And so what that was, that was doing is sc pulling down a feed of all of the combined sewer overflow events. So this is when our sewage system gets overburdened by a lot of rain or a lot of, you know, the, typically heavy rain is, is the cause. And then there is a release of sewage into the river system. So this happens from time to time, but it's only one way of measuring the amount of fecal coliform going into the river because, you know, there can be rain events that don't cause combined sewer overflows and just there's, you know, more animal activity or things are washing out. So it's actually a really complicated, it's a complicated system and CSOs are only one sort of estimate estimate and way of understanding it and there it's also very point in time and then diffuses so lots of reasons this is a complicated thing to track and to measure um, one thing i want to point out though is that again the global partnerships tech to pds is a canadian company proteus comes from the uk iosite these are partners of ours in israel where they have a lot of expertise in water tech particularly desalination so we really did look all over and brokered these partnerships along with others um, like our really good friends here at comcast to help us um, make a telemetry system that allows us to pull this down in real time. And, and, all, and one more thing I'll add there. Um, Comcast's partnership was actually really important for this project because we wanted to ensure that this would be an initiative for all of Chicago. Uh, as Elena mentioned earlier, we've got, oh, here's the map. We've got three branches. Um, the North Branch, Main Stem, and South Branch. And uh, we realized that folks outside of the downtown Riverwalk utilize this river and would like to interact with it. So uh, Comcast's partnership actually was great and uh, essential in helping us get that South Branch Pro. Yeah, it's a pretty bootstrappy project. Like we could tell you and break down after this, like the cost of like each probe and what it costs to maintain and how much it costs to like have the data, you know, talking to us all the time. So um, anyway, we have these three these are roughly where they're placed in the river, and that's because the quality of the river changes at these different points along the branch, and we care about that because we really want equitable river access all the way al along. Um, we have lots of other partners. So we have really important support from the Chicago Community Trust, which has a program called Great River Chicago that is eligible, uh, well, anyone, it's open, open call, um, but the idea is to help fund projects that were identified as priorities in this plan. And so for this next year, their theme is productive rivers. Um, so we're hoping, we're, we're applying now for second phase support. But the first phase was made possible in large part by the Chicago Community Trust and Comcast, as George said. 
Um, and then we had a lot of other partners that have made this work. Uh, we couldn't have done it without our strong partnerships with MWRD and the city of Chicago. So they make it possible for us to like have access to the river and the boats that allow us to help install the probes and check on the probes. There's so much that goes into this. We had a ton of community engagement and we are always looking for more partners. Uh, North River Commission, Sierra Club, Friends of the River, you know, people that have been longtime river stakeholders and stewards that are helping us with everything from volunteer sampling, we had to go calibrate the probes, um, to getting the word out about the survey that we are doing, which we'll talk about at the end. But um, we have a survey that's tracking basically what perceptions of the river are today so that we can understand how, with real-time data monitoring, they hopefully change tomorrow. Okay, so project timeline, just to give you a sense of why we're here tonight at Chi Hack Night. Um, we, this was our phase one, so it kind of kicked off uh, April 2019. And we concluded with a mile, we were in the rivers all summer, calibrating and testing these probes and trying to understand if what the real, real time data was telling us synced up to what our sample points were telling us. And so we were testing the tech, testing the setup, trying to see if this was going to work. And we built the static website. And then we cleared a really important milestone in September when we had our um, kind of public availing of the static site and also had our review scientific leadership committee come together and say you know, this is all our advisors from across the universities to say yes this looks good we think you're cleared to start talking about going real time so phase two is where we are now um, here we are in january kicking off the first phase we've launched an advisory committee which if you're interested we've got um, another meeting that we will have this is our current partners plus anybody who wants to become a partner to the project um, our description of partnership is loose. It can be that you want to spread the word about the survey, or you want to mobilize volunteers, you have some great idea about how to host an event, but we really want this next phase of, of the project to be incredibly inclusive. Like it's Chicago's rivers, this doesn't belong to us. We want it to be a big open data project and we're excited about real-time data quality monitoring beyond Chicago and other river systems too. So we're really excited about where this can all go. But we're now in this really intense phase of planning for the circled milestone, which is having real-time data live by Memorial Day. So that's our goal. We want you all to help us work towards that goal and make the project really great. So our goals for the year, we have to figure out how to have better data availability. So that's about consistency of power, reliable communication. Um, there's more sampling to get to better precision with our samples um, and more accuracy there. Um, there's a lot about inference. This is why we asked the question about how you communicate science to the public. Explaining what we're seeing. This is not as simple as like the red green flags on the beach where they sample it once in the morning and kind of say, good day for swimming, bad day for swimming. We're not, we don't want to be in the business of telling people what to do in the river. We just want people to get much better at interpreting what's the current state at any given time and how do you make better decisions based on that. But we don't want to be, you know, sort of telling people, you know, it's swimmable finally or it's not. Like we're just not really there yet and we want people to understand how to interpret what we do have. We want to bring in data from other sources. So if you know of a great citizen science project that's tracking amazing data about the river that matters in some way, we'd love to know. This website can be built out. We want to be, we're talking to MWRD about pulling in their own river quality data because, you know, we think the average Chicago resident probably would like one place to go to learn about their river, even though there's many partners that can feed into that. So we're excited to build a really kind of open source platform that pulls in a lot of great data from a lot of places. Um, and then we want to find a lot of ways to engage um, our, en our volunteers. Svetlana, do you want to talk about calibration and where we are in calibration? Yes, I'll quickly go over some of the issues that we need to uh, address to, in order to be able to have the reliable, reasonably accurate data. And one of them, of course, is calibration of our instruments. So there are actually two types of calibration we have to go through. One is internal calibration of the instruments themselves to make sure all the sensors are um, giving uh, reliable signals, um, accurate signals. And then another layer of calibration is to, um, as I was saying on those probes that we have in the river, uh, we have three sensors and all these three data streams are combined to give an estimate. And in this case, we are looking at fecal coliform. Uh, so we have to conduct tests, like the test that specifically for fecal coliform. And then we have to correlate those three uh, data streams to the fecal coliform, the actual 
estimates and so we need to get a range of different numbers mm -hmm. values to get a good calibration and that's uh, it's been quite a challenge uh, we've been doing it all last year and we still have to do it this spring uh, so we're developing a plan for that so th this is an example of how we are visualizing data we have a partner in Israel uh, IOSite uh, their data analytics company and <coughs> So they took, we're sending them uh, data from our sensors, but as Elena was saying, from other sources as well. So like MWD has their programs, uh, USGS has their collecting their data. Uh, so we're sending as much data as we can to them. And then they put it together um, on their platform, make, made it look nice, and so we can look separately at different data streams. Um, we have also two communication networks in this project. Uh, two of our probes were communicating via cellular uh, network, and then one of them uh, was using LoRaWAN, uh, which you're probably familiar with. It's a low, uh, low power, wide area network, uh, which is provided by Comcast, um, which, which is a network that communicates on a shorter range, so it can communicate on a city scale, for example, um, most frequently this is uh, like m this technology is used in the office space to communicate between the devices. But in this case, it's more. But it's a, it requires less energy, uh, and we thought it would be interesting to try and you know, test it as part of this pilot. Yeah. So you can see, <laughs> this is the not even beta version of what we want to be able to show at some point. Um, and this is the kind of like where the rubber hits the road for us now. We're trying to figure out what's in between the nice squiggly lines that Svetlana showed on the last page and something that makes sense to the public as an interpretable form of this data and how it's fluctuating in real time. So it won't look like this, but it's also not going to be a red or green flag. So we need to figure out exactly what that looks like and think about all the different user experience and you know, humans that are design questions that take people on the journey to understand what's going on with the river. Um, spring, summer 2020, we, these pictures are all to say, we really want it to be a big coming out party for H2 Now Chicago. We want everybody to sort of own this and love this and incorporate it into all of your events and help us you know, help you figure out how to get the word out. We just want everybody to be talking about the river. We want 2020 to be the sort of the year of you know, understanding the baseline and how do we move forward from here. So we would love your help. Um, do you want to talk about the launch, planned launch? Yeah, uh, around, well, f I'll back up real quick. Um, Memorial Day is the official start of the recreational season on the river as well as the lake, uh, if any of you are boaters or kayakers, uh, and that basically runs to Labor Day. So it's a short window, uh, but an important one for us. So prior to that, uh, we plan to have this real-time data streaming through some sort of tool on our existing platform, which Elena mentioned before is h2nowchicago.org. Um, along with that launch, uh, we do, like she mentioned, want to host and partner with whoever, uh, part or existing partners and new partners, uh, to help promote and grow awareness around this. Uh, also, to help gather more data from that survey she was mentioning. We've got a pre-survey uh, that is basically pre-live data. And then once the live data goes live, we will have a post-live data survey to help measure that uh, differentiation in um, perception and use of the river, hopefully. Um, and so uh, events will be held. We'll be having some uh, awareness campaigns. So if any of you are interested in partaking in that, please reach out. I, and then I like this photo because it kind of, this I feel like points to one of our sort of North Stars. For, th we're in New Zealand? This is in New Zealand? Auckland, right, Brian? Auckland? Auckland? Yes. Was this like a man on the street? You took this picture? Did you take this picture? Yeah, he was. Great. It's good to have people all over the place. That's the, yeah. Thank you, Ryan. Um, it's, but this is pretty great. It has a, I don't know if you can see this, but it says like, it's generally a low risk day. So um, the beach weather is good. This is the temperature. This is the kind of sunset, sundown. There's a lot of other things on there. So it's part of a contextual, you know, a broader, it's not just the river quality. It's like, it, how, it, how is today looking on the, on the waterfront, which I think we think is pretty interesting too. To this point in time, we've been uh, envisioning this to be, I think it was in the little description of the event tonight, a weather app for water quality in the river. 
Um, we are very open to suggestions and recommendations. Uh, and so any way we can communicate that, make it easy for somebody to pull up on their phone, because right now if you wanted to go interact with any waterway in the US and likely the world, and you wanted to know the water quality right then and there, you cannot do that. Um, especially with some of these more potent pollutants. Yeah. So uh, communicating that on an easy, understandable, uh, and accessible plat digital platform is big for us, but also through some of these more stable pieces of uh, infrastructure. Yeah. So our partner charge, I mean, again, I told you it's pretty loose. We want to have everybody help us work on user experience, inform people, develop new ideas for events and collaborations, and help us spread the word. We've got a bunch of new partners coming on board every day. We're really excited about that. Uh, your logo here. Um, and then I've talked a bit about our advisors. It's great. Thank you guys so much. We're here because we want you to beat this up and ask us really hard questions and help us make it much better. It's, a, it's sort of a simple thing and also a really complicated thing. So hopefully you got a taste of both of those dimensions of the project today and you're excited to work with us to make the Chicago River one of the world's great urban rivers. We're excited to work with all of you. Thanks so much. Hi. Uh, so all this information is about knowing what the water quality is but sort of the, the like true end goal is improving the water quality. So how do you like operationalize this information to make the water better? Yeah, that's a great question. So the river, as we said, there's there's a few main like public touch points. If you think about like kind of who, well, there's many public touch points. There's, you know, EPA at the federal level. We've got inner uh, multinational compacts that govern the quality of the Great Lakes. So there's a lot of different actors and players involved. We have very close relationships with uh, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, which is also really invested in the quality of the river, um, but also a lot of the advocacy groups you saw here. So we are here to kind of say, let's get information out. There's a lot of different channels to get that information acted on, including the public sector agencies that are responsible for making sure we're upholding commitments to federal you know, legislation, and also um, we have advocates that think that the bar should be higher, right? So and, so, and then there's the public, right? So who also are stakeholders and need to care. So all of them need to be informed and they're all kind of part of this and um, that's really important. But you said the end goal is water quality improvement and I think that's right, but we also wanna be really specific when we talk about the productivity goals of the river. Like we really want the river to be usable and we think that's important because there's a lot of economic value to communities being able to build things adjacent to the river and there's public health value to communities being able to recreate around the length of the riverfront and so we also want to help tell that story that it's not just about you know the, the quality of the river is important we have our hands on some of those levers we the community uh, and many of them we don't but there's also this other kind of story about how we track and measure the impact on local businesses, on public health. And so we're really trying to get this information in front of as many people as we can, you know, the Chamber of Commerce, Chicago Harbor, which works with a lot of the waterfront businesses, Chicago Department of Public Health, the Parks Department. So yeah, it's a, a lot of people need to care. And yeah, it's a great question. So uh, one of the ways you could think about the quality of the river is the quality of the wildlife in it. And it occurs to me that uh, capturing fish and testing them and uh, reporting on the uh, toxins in the fish. Because if you could establish that the fish were actually a low enough level that they are comparable or better than the lake, that I think would go a long way to sort of selling the idea that the river is a true uh, recreational thing. Yeah, or an, and especially for fishing use, right? That's one, well, yeah, which is really yeah, important. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's a uh, more complicated question uh, than you might anticipate because the lake and the river are different ecosystems. Also, the lake has a huge infestation problem with quagga mussels, and so the water quality is way different than it is in the river. Be I'm talking about the, within the fish themselves. Yeah. The oh, those levels? Yeah. So, this is uh, a shed, so this is a shed uh, and it's a shed yeah, question. Shed, yeah. but also MWRD does monthly does month testing on, the fish. Uh, on fish species. They track and measure what fish they catch, um, length and weight, uh, and they log all this data. And, and uh, a fact that one of our partners, Friends of the Chicago River, always throws out there is from the 1970s when the Clean Water Act was implemented, there were only seven fish species found in the Chicago <laughs> River system, and now there's over 77. Uh, and I believe that that fact is about five or 10 years old at this point. So that hopefully will have improved because since, uh, what, 24, 
2014 or 15, MWRD started implementing UV treatment at the O'Brien Wastewater Treatment Plant, which is on the North Branch. And for those of you who don't know, the Chicago River flows north to south. So everything up north is coming down and enters the Mississippi. So um, hopefully that has also helped improve uh, the wildlife as well. But invasives are a big problem in both the lake and the river. And so hopefully, I don't know, this data can help shape that in some way. Right. And I think to your point, it's tracking the quality, like how is fish quality tracking over time in the river? I don't know about the comparison to the lake, but as, as George said there, it's pretty distinct. So I think the more relevant comparison is like the river, river, aquatic environment, and those species relative to themselves over time is what I think the most people are looking at. Great. So what went into the decision to, uh, to what, what went into the siting place, uh, to deciding which site it, sites you would uh, sample from for each of the branches of the river? Yeah, that's a good question too. <laughs> uh, first of all, we didn't know how many sensors or probes we would have. We, it, we were limited by our budget uh, for the project, but we ended up with three. And, uh, you know, Chicago River, it flows from the north. Uh, there is a North Shore Channel where the O'Brien plant discharges to. There is the river itself that comes uh, from upstate. Um, and then it reaches here downtown the, the main branch and main branch mainly contains the lake water because in the summer those gates open uh, quite often and you can see the difference actually if you go on the, on the boat uh, there is a line almost uh, of brown and blue uh, at that point. Uh, yeah, and then down and south, uh, on the south branch, those two streams are combined, so it's kind of more mixed, but it's also a wider channel, so the hydrology is a little bit different in that stretch. So th that was our reasoning. We want to uh, try to track water quality on each of the branches okay. and see how they compare. Within the branch, I, was, I was curious, within the branch, what, how yeah. do you choose those branches? Um, yeah, those were more uh, connected <laughs> to the logistics of what we could do, uh, with the constraints that we had. Uh, so we worked with MWRD. Uh, they are great supporter for our project, and they already had their monitoring stations, which have been uh, around for over 20 years, I think. Uh, so they have those pipes, steel pipes, where they have their probes, and they agreed that we could co-locate ours with theirs, and that's how we decided to go with this, those locations. Can I add one quick, yeah, and, and just to come back to the sort of equitable access point that we made early on, it was really important to understand if the river quality is significantly better or worse in some communities, we want to know that, right? We want people to know that so that there is more, because it may be that we have to have, there's already different plans to sort of treat and deal with the water, but we just want to make sure we understand that because we are really big believers in not, you know, it's not just about the downtown riverfront, which has come a long way in the last five years, and that's great, but you know, we're really interested in all the branches, so. Uh, this, uh, this reminds me of the, uh, I guess, the, uh, the Clean Air Act, the ambient air monitoring, the real-time yeah. sort of stuff that's being done for particulate matter and, yeah. and all that stuff like that. Yeah. So I was, I was wondering, is uh, this technology, can it be used for, like, NPDES, like, the, the non-source pollution discharge, for, you know, to look at other things, you know, the, phosphorus the yeah, yeah, phosphorus, nitrogen, automobile bil bil emissions and stuff like that. So yeah. it's monitoring past microbial and, and be used for regulatory enforcement? Um, yeah, that is a good question. I don't think this particular uh, probe that we're using can be used for, the, for those purposes because uh, it's not a direct measurement. So we, we can correlate the sensor readings to fecal coliform, but we can never say exactly and so it has, there is a regulatory level there. They have to approve which method you're using for compliance. But the, I mean, the probe itself can accommodate different sensors. So if there are, right now there is no real-time phosphorus monitoring sensor, for example. Right. That's like a big, next big thing in the sensor world. Right. Um, there is a nitrogen, uh, nitrate, I think, optical sensor. Mm -hmm. And so they can be stuck in there and Basically, it's the, the probe itself is just like a vehicle for different sensors, whatever you want to monitor. And one more thing there. Um, as Elena mentioned earlier, we do 
hope to grow the scope of this project to other markets, but also other water quality indicators and pollutants. And so measuring other things like heavy metals or nitrates, phosphates are certainly uh, within the realm of possibility as we uh, try to make this online platform more robust. You know, we see this being a potential place where you could be in LA and then check the water quality in Boston, in the Boston River or whatever the river there is called, I'm not sure. But, uh, uh, but you know, Charles, thank you. Uh, it, could, it could be a great platform to track water quality in these urban waterways across the globe, potentially. Mm -hmm.